This sermon is for you. You're all welcome to listen in. I'm not going to say anything you can't hear. We've watched these young people. Some of them have been here since they were just newborns carried into the building. Some of them came a little later. Mallory, we're glad you're part of our life here. But today is your day. It is the day that you make a decision. Your parents make most of the decisions, don't they? Most of them, the important ones. Oh, you, you have your opinion, but then they get, you get vetoed. Yeah, so today we're going to read a little bit of scripture and talk uh, about some of these things that I hope you understand how important what you do today is. You are going to publicly stand, a few of you, uh, Faith on in the back here, and two of you are going to be baptized. The rest of you, I hope you will remember your baptism and be thankful that this is a day that God will look upon for all eternity as the day that you affirmed your faith and committed yourselves to the things of Christ. We're reading from John's Gospel a little bit of the, the 14th chapter and this was near the end of Jesus' life, probably within hours of his arrest and then the quickly things followed to his crucifixion and I know you're aware of that, you know those stories. And somehow when people are talking with somebody they think they might not see again soon or maybe never, th that takes on a special quality when, when somebody says to you, we may never be together again, so I want to tell you this. And that's kind of what Jesus was saying. My, my father came to this country, he was uh, born in Italy, and when he was six years old, his family came to this country, but my, his grandparents, my great-grandparents did not come. And my dad, as a six-year-old, said, I remember standing on that back railing of the train saying goodbye to my grandparents, knowing I would never see them again. And you know, as long as my dad lived 84 years, he never forgot saying goodbye to somebody he loved and knew in this life he'd never see them again. Jesus had been teaching these disciples. How old was Jesus when he died? you remember? Approximately? About 33 yeah, we think, maybe 34, we're not, we're not absolutely certain. Uh, and he had not been in public ministry most of his life. He only preached for how many years? Three. Close. That's a good guess, Jack. I can always count on Jack for a guess. <laughs> no, he preached for about three years. And he'd been with the same group of guys. There were how many of those guys? Twelve, correct. And we called them what? The disciples. Later we called them the apostles, right? So these guys were close to Jesus. They'd been there, some of them, from almost the first day that Jesus preached. And they had been with him. They watched him heal people. They watched him speak with words of authority. They watched him handle difficult situations. They saw him do many miraculous things. Still, they were a little bit uncertain of the most important thing. So Jesus sat down with them here at the Last Supper. We believe all this took place that last evening they were together. And he said, I have some important things to tell you because Jesus knew he wouldn't have another opportunity. And he began by saying, I don't want you to be worried. I don't want you to be upset. Uh, how do you say you're upset? What, what word do you use uh, for saying, don't have a cow, man? You know, who says that? Bart Simpson, you know. Uh, somebody told me afterward, they said, in their house, they say, don't get your panties in a bunch. <laughs> that was not me. Don't get bent out of shape. Have you ever heard that? You know? Uh, my dad uh, had a phrase he used to use with us at home. Uh, he would often say something like, uh, don't be upset, don't lose your cool. He had a, a bunch of phrases I remember from the time that I was a young, young guy. It's his way of saying, just settle down. Things might be a little chaotic, but just settle down. As Jesus was going through these last few hours with his disciples, they began to sense some really difficult things were coming, and he could see they were agitated. And so he said these words, Let not your hearts be, you know the next word, troubled. Don't be anxious. An exercise for you, your brand new church members in about half an hour, maybe 20 minutes. Get a New Testament, a cheap one. Uh, get a magic marker and read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each time you read a place where Jesus speaks and says, do not be afraid, fear not, peace be with you, all those ideas, 
put the highlighter on that. You'll be surprised how many times Jesus is in a place where people are anxious. They are, they're upset. They're having a cow, man. And Jesus said, just take it easy. Because Jesus sees a much larger perspective. How long do you think we're going to live in this world? I saw on the paper the other day a woman died. The oldest woman they knew, 116. Uh, that's pretty gold. good. Uh, you know, I don't know how long any of us are going to live, but I know that we're not going to get to 116. I don't think we have any record setters here. But eternity lasts forever. And so Jesus is telling his friends, this life may be challenging at times, but you don't need to get bent out of shape. In other words, he, what he actually said is, don't let your hearts be upset. Don't be troubled. I'm going to read a little further down now because Jesus was to the point where he had to make sure they knew what he was doing. And so this is from John's Gospel, chapter 14, beginning with verse 8 and reading through verse 17. Uh, they still were having a little confusion, and so it comes down to Philip. One of the disciples turns to Jesus and says, Lord, show us the Father. That would be God. Show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and still you do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves, because they'd seen him do all these amazing things. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Then listen to this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth. We call it the Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, to God. be to God. Amen. Pray with me just a moment. Lord, we thank you for these young men and women sitting here today. We thank you for their families that have guided and guarded them along the way. And we thank you they've reached the age now where they make this important decision for themselves. And we rejoice that they've already told us they intend to follow Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I wish we had lots of time to talk about this. I think there's a lot of interesting parts to this. But simply put today, uh, Jesus had been with his disciples a long time. And I think he was a little disappointed that they weren't catching on better than they were. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how Jesus behaved in, in this conversation. But it's interesting, I think, is that, first of all, it started with Thomas. Jesus, a little earlier than what we read today, Jesus said, I'm leaving you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you, and where that is, it'll be okay, don't worry, I'll come and get you, and one day we'll be there together. And then he turned to, to his disciples and said, and you, you guys know where I'm going. They'd had three years. You know where I'm going, and, and at that point, Thomas said, Lord, we're not sure where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus, I'm pretty sure, was disappointed. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to God except by me. Then Philip jumps in, I think, to rescue his buddy Thomas. And he says, Lord, if you just show us the Father, we'll be okay. We'll be satisfied. You know, the scripture doesn't say, then Jesus rolled his eyes. <laughs> Your parents ever roll their eyes when you guys don't get it right? You know, they're trying to teach you something, and then you do what you do, and they go... You ever seen that look? This morning? <laughs> Jack, I know. I've, it's going on behind you right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure you do give that look to your parents. When you don't get it, you know, we sometimes roll. I think Jesus surely rolled his eyes a little. I don't know. That's just my guess. Jesus said, you've been around me enough to know that these are the things that you're supposed to now be trusting. And you shouldn't worry. And you should know that when you've seen me, you already know who God is. If you know Jesus, you know God. They were in the same business. Did you know that? It was a family business. Yeah. 
According to scripture, Jesus was there at the foundation of the world. Nothing was created without Christ. The Holy Spirit was part of the Trinity. We'll do that in a few weeks when we celebrate Trinity Sunday. But this was a moment in which Jesus said, you guys just need to put your trust. And you need to believe in me. He began this by saying, believe in God, believe also in me. Not have a good opinion of me. Not think I'm a nice guy. Not think I did some good things. You believe in me. Trust in me. It's the family business. Any of you guys have a family business that you're going to follow in your parents' footsteps? No? no. I, I mean, it, it could be. It could be, uh, you're going to be an engineer? Maybe. Yeah, kind of like your dad. So it could be, uh, what would we call that? DiMatteo and son or DiMatteo and dad? Yeah. Yeah, we could call it that. Uh, I think we could call the Neil and Jonathan could be the French connection. That'd be good. You know? uh, Mallory, I'm not sure whether you'll do something. The point is that lots of family businesses, farms for instance, any of you come from a farm? You know? You're supposed to do your chores, you're supposed to do your work. Everybody pitches in and gets the work done. Jesus and God were in the same business and Jesus could say, if you know me, you already know God. Now that's scripture. And there's lots in here. We can't take time for all of it today, but here's the part I want you to think about. Jesus said, if you get this right, you're going to do even greater things than I've done. Can you believe that? Jesus said, greater things than these will you do. Now, does that mean we're going to do more spectacular things? You ever walk on water? You ever feed a, a multitude of 5,000? I don't think any of us are going to do more spectacular things than Jesus, but let me, let me count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, twenty, two, 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 two hundred and twenty-two, twenty and twenty-four. Two hundred twenty-four, give or take one. If we all leave this room today and go out and do something in the name of Jesus, are we going to do greater things? Not because any one of us is going to do anything terrific, it's because all of us together can be a witness for Christ in the world. That's pretty impressive. You can do your part, you'll 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 do your part. And in that way, I think we do do greater things than Jesus did. Not because we're better than Jesus, there are more of us. And then Jesus said, this last thing I'll tell you. If you love me, you'll do it my way. And that's the, that's the whole upshot of this gathering here today. You have many decisions to make. Your parents are going to be less and less involved in your lives. And you're going to be more and more directly responsible for your decisions. The question is, will you live your life according to what Jesus has invited us to do? Or are you going to live life the way that seems best to you? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So, when Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father, let me extrapolate that just a little bit further. So, if you've seen Benjamin, you've seen Jesus, because he's a follower. If you've seen Mallory, you've seen Jesus, because she represents him. Justin and Jordan, whether it's, a, you know, any of, the, any of the gang here this morning, any of the gang that sat in this seat earlier, any of the gang that's downstairs this morning at 1045, you guys have come to the place where you're saying, I want to be a witness for Christ, and in that way, we're going to belong. Just as God and Jesus were one, we will also be one. So you're in the family business now. The family business of redemption. God redeeming the world through Christ. And as followers of Christ, you're in the redemption business. It's a family business and you're invited today. Pray with me. Lord, I am thankful for each of these students. We thank you for their commitment this past year. Thank you for the homes from which they have come. Thank you for those family members parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, aunts, and uncles, all the neighbors and Sunday school teachers, the people that have taken time with them to help point them on the way of life. But today, they stand here individually and then collectively to say that they are anxious to live a life that matters, that they're a part of the family business of redemption for God so loved the world. And in that same loving spirit, they take a step of faith today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.